Praise God. Lord, we love you, Jesus. If you would, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms chapter 23 and verse 4. And when you get there, say amen. Praise God. In Psalms 23, verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Lord, we ask, God, that you would have your way in this place today, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh God, that you would anoint my lips, Lord, that I may speak your word to your people, O oh God. I pray, O oh Lord, that if there be any thoughts or bias in me, Lord, I pray, O oh God, that it would be taken away and I would be used as a mouthpiece for you, O oh God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would fall in this place, O oh God, as your word is spoken, O oh Lord. Lord, and it would break the yokes, O oh Lord, and that your anointing would flow in this place and through and to every individual, O oh God. I pray, Lord, Lord, that you would move in a mighty way. We are expecting great things from you today, Lord. And we thank you for it, oh God. And we give you praise and we give you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I wonder if we could just give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated. Psalms 23 is probably a very familiar chapter of Scripture if you've ever read the Bible a lot or if you've ever been to church for most of your life. You've heard this a time or two. It's very popular. It's one of the most popular Psalms of David. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And that, that's what I want to minister to our own today for just a little bit. I promise I won't be long. But this, if I had to title it, it would be titled, There is Victory in the Valley. There is Victory in the Valley. And see, many times on our journeys with God, we'll climb these spiritual mountains, and it's the high times, and everything feels great. Everything's so clear, and everything's so awesome and it's like oh man I love loving I love living for God it's just so awesome it's so great everything's easy the the trek up the mountain's hard but by the time you get to the top of the mountain you're not worried about the hike it's just the view and you're right there with God and God's right there with you and you can hear him clearly but then there's comes time to go down the mountain and when you go down the mountain you enter into the area called the valley. And the valley is the low points that we experience in our lives and in our journeys with God. And in these valleys, there's place for doubt and there's place for unbelief to creep in and there's place for things to attack you. It's the test. It's the trial. You're amongst everything that is lower than God. And sometimes you can feel as though you're alone and maybe God has left you, but there is victory in the valley. There is one very famous story in the Bible, and when I say the scripture or the passage of scripture, a lot of you are going to know exactly which one I'm talking about. But we're going to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to start in verse 1. And many of you may not have called it, but this is a story about a valley. We all know it as the story of David and Goliath, but this is a story about a valley. And so it says in, chap in verse 1 of chapter 17, it says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Soko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Soko and Ezekah. And if I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side so that there was a valley between them. And so we see here where 
Israel is fighting a battle that's against their, uh, some would say their arch nemesis, the Philistines. You always read about David and he's going to fight the Philistines. Or if you're reading about Saul, he's fighting the Philistines. Most of Samuel is fighting the Philistines. It's one of the biggest problems that Israel ever had. And so we find that on the other side of this valley, there's their enemies, the Philistines, and this battle is taking place in the valley. And so little does Israel know, but the Philistines come packing their secret weapon this time. And so continuing on in verse 4, it says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, and his name was Goliath of Gath. And you're not going to understand the height thing unless you've studied it. And it says, whose height was six cubits and a span. And you can ask many people, and it means many different things to many people. But I found one yesterday that says that he could have been over 11 foot tall. This man could have been standing over 11 foot tall. And so we're going to read some descriptions of some things he was wearing. And he had a helmet of brass on his head. So imagine this 11-foot tall dude, and he's got this helmet of brass on his head. That helmet had to weigh like me. And you don't want to carry me around on your head. Just saying. And he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, which again is a lot more than I am. You don't want to carry me around. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And his staff and his spear was like a weaver's beam. And I don't know if you know what a weaver's beam, but it's like, yay, long, taller than me. It's pretty big. And so, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. Very heavy. This is not an ordinary man. This is no LeBron James six foot, seven foot person. This isn't the tallest man we've ever seen. This isn't some uh, bodybuilder that decided he was going to wake up. I'm a fight for the Philistines one day. This is somebody who was huge. Not only was he huge, he was strong. And not only was he strong, but he was deadly. Because the Bible says he was trained from his youth to be a warrior. This is a man that... You don't want to mess with. If I saw Goliath come out, I know I'd be running the other way. I may not be able to run the way. I might be frozen like a deer in the headlights. Like Terrified, man. Terrified. This dude is huge. And listen, he comes to him and he says, he says, why are you come out to... Um, he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man. He said, I don't want to fight all of you. I just want to show you just how strong. Just send me one guy. Let me show you what I can do to one guy and you won't want to mess with me. He said, Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and kill me, he said, Then we'll be your servants. But... If I kill him, you're going to have to be my servant. And the Israelites was like, "Mm, I don't know about that, Goliath. I think we're going to stay up here on our side of the mountain. You can stay down there in that valley. And so the giant starts to reside in the valley. How many know that there's giants in the valleys you go through in life? And there's things that you have to wrestle and fight in the valleys and the low points in your life. Hallelujah. So Goliath begins to reside in the valley day by day. He comes out and he cries out to the Israelites and mocks them. He says, send me a man. Choose a man. Come on, just send me somebody. Just send me somebody who's got enough guts to face me. I know that you're like at my knees, but come on. I know, don't you just want to try? Don't you just want to take a chance and... He's chanting and he's, he's mocking and he's just trying to rile them up. You know, like that little sibling that likes to push your buttons just until you explode. So Goliath is the big sibling that's like, you've been doing it to me, I'm going to be doing it back to you. 
Because I know I can kick your tail. And so, now, we see that whenever he comes out, every time, they're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting. Every time Goliath even steps foot onto the battlefield, the Israelites immediately turn and run. Like I said, I think I'd probably run too. And if you saw me running, you might want to run because big boy don't run for fun. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. So, all these grown men, all these men of war, these people who are supposed to be the Israelites' army, they're the armies of God. This one guy has them so terrified that every one of them would turn around and run. I think I'd be running too. Just by simple shock value, I think. 11 foot dude. I, I can't get past that dude. 11 foot tall. It means he's at least like up there. We'd barely be able, we wouldn't be able to fit him in the doors. He'd have to get on his knees to come in the doors. This dude's huge. This dude's huge. And now, now we're going to talk about the hero of the story. And I've already told you, it's David. How many knows who King David is? You've read of King David, right? You've heard the stories of how David... Or Saul killed his thousands or slew his thousands and David killed his ten thousands. Well, this is before that. <laughs> David, and you can read it many times. If you read chapter 17, it's going to tell you a lot. David was a youth. So David was tiny. Where's Caleb at? Hey, Caleb. Hey, buddy. Come here. Come here. So, I'm Goliath, and Caleb's David. And one day, David's daddy, old brother Brandon, told brother Caleb, he said, Look, I'm going to need you to go to the battlefield and take your brother some supplies. I don't want you doing nothing else. Just take him some supplies. You, you're too little to be fighting. You're too little to be fighting. And so... Little old David runs and takes some supplies, and he gathers all this stuff. He goes to his brothers, and it just so happens when little old David, little old Caleb, arrives at the battlefield, Goliath comes out to mock and to call out the armies of God. And see, little old David had already won some secret battles. He had already fought some stuff in the secret place that nobody had already knew about. And he's just a kid. He's tiny. He don't look like much of nothing. And so little old David say, hey, that's me. I'm David. <laughs> yeah, you're good. So little old David, he goes, and he's going to go fight Goliath. And I'm nowhere near Goliath's size. So I imagine the height difference was a little bit more than what you just saw. And that little boy was so angered by the audacity of the Philistine to even dare to call out the armies of God. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would taunt and mock the armies of God? Who, do he, who does he think he is? Who, who do you think you are that you can... Tell me that I'm not good enough. How, who do you think you are that you can tell me that I can't win? Who, are, who do you think you are that you can intimidate me and trot on me and walk on me? You are nothing but a dirty, uncircumcised Philistine, said the wee little man. And as he's saying this, his... All the, other arm, all the other soldiers are sitting there like, boy, you better shut up before he hears you. If he hears you, he's going to think it's me. You better hush. Look, hush. But since you asked, you know, if you go kill this guy, Saul's going to let you live for free. He's going to give you his daughter. He's going to put you in his house. But I wouldn't advise it, David. You better hush. That giant's going to hear you in that valley. You better hush. You better not, you better not proclaim, proclaim victory before you ever go to the battle. 
that giant's going to hear you in the valley. You better not talk a big game right now on the mountainside, David, because that giant's waiting for you in the valley. So you better hush up and just be afraid. Just be careful because if you talk too loud or if you get too bold, you might be taken down. So hush. Keep quiet. And not only were they telling him, look, hush, boy, hush. His brother looked at him and he said, man, who do you think you are? You, you talking about who does the giant think he is? you seen this guy? Have you seen this? Have you seen what you're up against, David? You're tinier than I am, and I'm scared to death. I, I just was down there. You don't know. You ain't stood beside him. That dude started walking on the battlefield, and I took off running. And David, you're, you're a youth. You're just a kid. You're nothing. There's nothing that you can do that would help anybody. What are you even doing here? He said, I know the naughtiness of your heart and your pride. And David said, hmm, my pride, the naughtiness of my heart. Yeah, I just wanted to see the battle. Dad sent me here, by the way. I got your food. Thanks, bro. Thank you for the, I, I, yeah, I just ran away from those, as his brother called them, his few sheep. He said, you, you left the field of your few sheep to come out here to the battle. He said, you're, you're not here for any good. You're not doing any good here. He's like, oh, I brought you food. There's a, there's a message in that one, too. Don't shoot the messenger, either. He might have your food. And I don't know if y'all can tell, but big boy likes food. <laughs> Praise God. So anyway, old David just can't let it go. He just will not let it go. He's like, man, this Philistine, he just, he, he won't shut up. He won't close his mouth. He wants to keep mocking the armies of God. And notice David never says he's mocking me. He always says he's mocking the armies of God. He's calling out the armies of God. He's trying to tell everybody else, look, guys, do you not know who is on your side? Do you not know who do you belong to? He said, we are the armies of God. Is this giant bigger than our God? Is this giant bigger than who we serve? And I just can't help but believe that David was told some stories from some from grandpa and grandma about some stories of the promised land, the battles of Joshua. And I can't help but think that David's like, I could be a Joshua. You know what? And gr great grandma was in that wall when Joshua was mar marching around Jericho and she saw them walls fall. He said, and I, and I just could imagine that grandma telling them the story. They didn't even do anything. All they did was walk in circles and then scream. And the walls fell down. And this is the armies of God. This is what the armies of God can do. And so I'm, I can imagine that David, like that kid with the, with the superhero, don't you know the power that this guy has? Don't you know that the power that our God has? Have you not heard the stories of what happened for grandma and grandpa and for, for elder and them and their, their place and their situation? Did you not hear about the battles that He won for them? Did you not hear about the victories in their valleys? Did you not hear about the wars where they chased them and they chased them until there was no more? Did you, you miss out on story time too? He said, that, that's not fiction. That's our history. That's who we are. And he, he's thinking, uh, I could see him. He, and God don't change. God's the same then as he is now. So why am I afraid of this giant? Why would you be afraid of this giant? And people say, hush boy, hush boy. And you ain't nothing but prideful. You you just you just think you're better than everybody. You 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 think you're bigger and badder than everybody. You you talking about how you fight those demons and you go into spiritual warfare. What? Who do you think you are? You think you're something important? 
important? You think you're big and bad? And David was like, no, but I know someone who is. I know the God of the armies. And so they was like, well, if, you, if you've just decided and you've made up your mind, we're going to take you before Saul. And so David goes before Saul, and Saul's like, man, you sure about this? And the Bible says Saul was tall. Saul was a, a huge dude too. And so Saul's looking at itty-bitty old David. And see, I'm probably a more accurate Saul to the David than I am a Goliath to the David. But so Saul's like, man. This little kid don't know what he's doing. He ain't, he ain't ever fought a day in his life. He's a shepherd's boy. Okay, man, if you, if you just have decided that you're going to go and fight to your death for no reason, because you're going to lose, basically what Saul's telling him. He said, at least let me give you my armor. And so he tries to put his armor on David, and so now... Here's another section I would like you to try to imagine something. Try imagining my clothes on Caleb. It don't work. So I could see David now putting on this armor of this humongous, regular-sized dude. And it's swallowing David whole. And David's like, man, I don't need this. He said, I haven't proven this armor. He said, I can't even fit in it. I'm a kid. You want me to put on a grown man's armor and go out there and fight? He's like, nah, man. He said, look, all I need are those five smooth stones. He said, so I'm going to go out to the creek. I'm going to grab me some stones, and y'all meet me at the battlefield. And so David goes, and he, I'm sure Saul was like, what? You can go and get some rocks out of the brook? And he didn't even, he didn't even get jagged rocks he didn't even get sharp rocks he got smooth rocks he's, he's talking about getting little bitty rocks to take down this giant what are you man this dude's lost his mind okay we'll meet you there david and so david goes off he gets his rocks he puts them in his sling and he he goes back to the battle and notice david didn't wait for the philistine to come mocking again david marched right into the valley. He said, I see you over there. I know you're there. So now I'm going to meet you. He said, come on, big boy, where you at? And Goliath comes down, and as he's walking, I, it already tells us what he says, but I could imagine what he's thinking. Man, they could choose anybody, and they're going to choose this runt? This dude, this dude's small. He's a kid, and they're going to let a kid fight me? And this is for the servitude of your country. If I kill this guy, you're all my slaves. And this is the guy you want to send? Well, he's the only guy that wanted to. Uh, the rest of us would rather just sit back up on the mountain. But David come down, and, and Goliath said, What am I, a dog to you, that you would send a kid? That you would send some little boy to fight me. What am I? Do you think that I'm just a dog? If you would have asked David, he probably would have said, Yes, you're nothing but an uncircumcised Philistine. You are a dog. And he said, Because you don't serve my God. Right? And so, now we find... In Samuel 17, 43, and I, I warned Sister P that I would be jumping around the entire chapter of 17 today. But we're going to start in 45, and this is what David said to the Philistine. So now remember, the Philistine didn't come mocking. David didn't even wait. He's like, I've made up my mind, I'm gone. And so he meets the Philistine in the valley. He meets the, the giant in the valley. And David said unto the Philistine, he said, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name 
of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He didn't stop there. That would have been enough. Because by this time, all the Israelites' jaws have dropped to the dirt. And they're like, just take it. Just get it over with. So now David continues. He said, this day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. David ain't even fought yet. The first punch ain't even been thrown. And he said, you're going down, big boy. He said, today. It's not going to be tomorrow. Not the next day. He said, right now, this little kid's about to take you down. He said, so this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. And I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistine this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly, he said, look, I'm putting these people on notice. He said, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And He will give you unto our hands. He said, and it came to pass, always, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted, and he ran toward the giant. This little old boy ran, went running toward that giant. He reached in that sling pocket, pulled out a stone, and flung a rock. One rock. For this giant that had every grown man in Israel shaking in their boots, this kid took one rock and the name of the Lord and the power of his God. And he slung that rock. And that rock hit right in the middle of his head and sunk into his forehead and the giant fell dead. giant didn't die when he cut his head off. The giant died when he flung the rock. The thing that nobody thought would work. The thing that he was being mocked for. David was being mocked for by his own people. This little kid is going to grab some rocks to go fight this dude with a big old weaver's beam spear that's made of iron and a shield that another man has to carry for him. And he's going to take some rocks. It ain't the rocks that's going to win the battle. It's God. See, what we've got to realize is that in our valleys, God's with us in those valleys, and those giants don't stand a chance. There is victory in a valley when you go in the valley with God. Ain't no Goliath that can stand against you if you've got God on your side. I don't care if you went into battle with a sword or a spear or a shield. You could go in there with a rock, and God's going to win that battle for you because the battle is not ours. The outcome's not up to us. Because the enemy can't win. Because he's already lost. We just simply lay down and don't fight. So it's not a 50-50 chance they win or I lose. It's a, if I go, I'm going to win. So I don't, I don't know what kind of valleys people are facing today. I don't know what you're going through in your personal life. I don't know the giants you face at home or the things that you have come and fought because you fight them at home in the secret place. See, David also had those secret battles before the giant. Before you're ready for a giant, you must first go through the secret battles. And see, he took out a bear. And you know what he used to fight the bear? Nothing. And he fought a lion. You know what he used to fight the lion? Oh, come on. Y'all know the answer. Nothing. Not a thing. In fact, the Bible says he grabbed the lion by the beard and flung him. This kid grabbed the lion by the beard and flung him. What? And you're telling me that this giant stands a chance. See, what? The Israel didn't know, and what the giant didn't know is that David was already a champion. Not only was he a champion, but he was already the king. 
Because see, just a few chapters before, Samuel had already come and said, hey, Jesse, there's going to be a king come out of your boys. He said, bring your sons before me. Let me look at them. And one of these boys of yours is going to be the king. So Jesse lines up all these boys. Again, David is counted out. They don't even bring David. They said, uh, well, here's so-and-so, here's so-and-so, so-and-so. And Samuel's like, okay, let's pray for this one. Surely he's the king. God said, nope, not the king. Let's pray for the, sure, surely he's the king. He looks like, no, he's not the king. Surely he's not, he's not the king. So on, so on. And Samuel's like, hmm. He said, well, I'll try again, God. I'm going to do the same thing again, God. That's the definition of insanity. See, Samuel was insane. This dude was insane. Not only was he insanely faithful, but he was insane. This dude had some crazy faith. Because for one, he could have been killed for going to anoint another king. But he's doing it anyway. Now he's going to do the same thing again. We do that a lot, right? We we fell in a battle, in a spiritual battle with something that we struggled with. And, oh, well, I'll try again and do the same thing, but I'll do it better. Now, I'm not calling you insane. But the literal definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. So Samuel's like, hmm. God, I'm going to try again and pray for these guys again. And so he goes and prays for each of them again. And no, 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 no. Samuel's like, God, are you sure that one of Jesse's boys is going to be king? Yeah, I'm sure Samuel asked him. Ask him if he's got some more kids. So Samuel says, okay. He said this is his son's. but So he says, hey, Jesse, hey, bud, you got any more kids? He's like, yeah, I got one of them, but he ain't worth much. He's just my little shepherd. He watches over the few sheep in the field I got, and I I guess we could call him in. And I mean, he's not going to be the king. I mean, if Jesse thought he was had an actual chance to be the king, Jesse would have brought him there first. But something tells me that David was not the favorite child. Something tells me that Jesse probably didn't care for David too much. Maybe David was a little bit annoying. I don't know. But, or maybe they were just all jealous of David. Because the Bible did say he, he had a ruddy complexion, which means, which literally means that he was lighter skinned than them, and he was handsome. So maybe, maybe they was a little jealous of him, or some people say that maybe he had a different mother. I don't know. I don't know David like that. I just know what I read. And so they finally get David, call him in from the thing. And so Samuel's waiting. Man, if I wait here any longer, Saul's going to figure out what I'm doing. Y'all better hurry up. And so David finally comes. And yeah, I'm not used to this mic. Um, David finally comes, and Samuel goes to pray for him. And God says, That's him. And Samuel says, This this little guy, this, this is the new king. And he's like, yeah, that's the king. That's King David. You better anoint him right now. But Saul's not even out of, he's not even lost the king. Anoint him. And so now this kid that's been anointed king's done come and killed the giant for the, Saul, for the king that was shaking in his boots and hiding in his castle. So you don't read that Saul was on the front lines. And if you've read any more about David, you find that when the king's not out on the front lines, it gets into trouble. So my guess is that Saul was up to no good. There was something not right. Which, I mean, God had already removed his favor from him. But Saul was found in his castle while all his men were out there fighting the battle for him. But see, he didn't really have the authority that he used to in the battle anymore because he was no longer the king in God's eyes. See, that king showed up whenever that little boy come to bring his brothers some food. And that king went before the false king and was like, I'm not wearing your armor. He said, my king's on my side. 
got them rocks, and took down that giant. So now David's a king and a champion. A king and a champion. And that's why we read it at the very beginning. If you would, if I'm coming to a close, if we could all stand. And that's why the scripture that we read at the beginning, and I, I don't know exactly when he wrote this psalm. I don't know. But I just have to believe it was probably after the battle or it was in memory of the battle with Goliath. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And yea, though I, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of that old giant, Yea, though I walk through the valley of that shadow of that old giant, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me when I'm in the battle with the giant. His rod and his staff is to, there to comfort me. He's there with us when we go into the valley to fight the giant doesn't matter what kind of giant we're facing today. It doesn't matter what we are fighting in our private lives or what we're fighting in the low points in our relationship with God or the low points in our journey with God. He is always there to fight for us. He is always there to fight for us. It doesn't matter how hopeless it seems. A kid fought an 11 foot dude. You telling me that doesn't sound hopeless? If we measured them up in boxing. Pastor, just inform me, that wall is 12 foot tall. Goliath was about that tall. And the, yeah, and I actually found some of that. David was probably considered about five, 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 six, which is probably about Judah's height. So if you measure them up in boxing, the reach of that 12-foot guy is going to destroy that little dude. The little dude ain't even going to be able to land a hit. It seemed impossible. It's improbable, but it's not impossible. The odds may look like they're not in your favor, but God is in your favor. God is on your side, so nothing, nothing, I'm going to say it again, nothing, can defeat us because God is on our side. We are in the armies of God just like the Israelites back then. But we've got to realize that we must first go to battle before He can ever fight the battle. If you're sick of things mocking you and who you've become and saying, oh, you really haven't changed. You're not, you're not any different than what you used to be. If you're sick of that, then it might be time to go into a valley and slay a giant. Because that giant likes to mock. That giant likes to poke at the weaknesses that we have. That giant likes to point out the past that you might be trying to hide. Or that past that you're a little bit ashamed of. That giant's going to continue to poke and prod. But the battle's already ours. For we are the armies of God. It doesn't matter what personal giants we're fighting. These altars are open. I wonder if we could just go ahead and gather around the front. It doesn't matter the giant, the issue, the problem, the things that somebody said about you, the things that somebody has labeled you. It doesn't matter what people think. God is on our side. God is for us. And there's... With God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. It might look improbable. It might feel impossible. You're, you may feel like there's no way I can win this. But we serve a God. And He's very familiar with the giant in the valley. And He's done fought him a time or two. And He already knows. He said, look, David. Look, Andrew, you don't have to worry about him. Go meet him. Don't run and hide. Don't stay up here on the mountain. Don't be scared of what you're going to face in the valley. You've got to go through this. He said, because on the other side, there's another mountain. 
He said, on the other side, there's another mountain. There's another level waiting for you. But first, you've got to go through the valley. I don't know what you're facing right now, but there's a mountain on the other side of the valley. There's another level that God wants to bring you to. He's not done with you yet. There, this is not it. You're destined for more. You're worth more. I wonder if we could raise our hands all across this building right now. Oh Lord. Come on, let's pray in the Holy Ghost for just a second. what family pedigree you come from. It doesn't matter who your mama or your daddy is. It doesn't matter who your grandma or grandpa is. It don't matter. It don't matter who you were. It's who you are now. And God is with you. And God is for you. And God has already won the battle in the valley. There is victory in the valley. I wonder if someone can just receive that victory in the valley right now. Lord, we love you. We praise you, God. We magnify you. We thank you for fighting our battle. Fear has no place in the life of a believer. Fear has no place in the life of a believer. The Bible tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. See, that giant that we're so scared of ain't nothing but a chihuahua. He's casting that shadow on the wall and he's making himself look real big and bad. But his bark's worse than his bite, I promise. His bark's worse than his bite. You don't have to be afraid. In fact, the Bible tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. And the only perfect love that you can ever experience is the love of God. And every one of you that just received the Holy Ghost, you have now been given that perfect love. You have now been given that power and that victory in the valley. There is nothing that you can't walk through that God will not fight for you before you ever get there. Every battle that you face is already won. But we've got to understand that you can't let doubt and you can't let the voices of other people creep in. You are victorious. God has called you to be victorious. You are a warrior. You started warring before you ever even became a warrior. You were a warrior in the secret places before you was ever a warrior in the valley. You've already got the victory. You don't have to be afraid of anybody else or what they think of you because that doesn't matter. God has called you. God has anointed you. And now He's given you His Spirit. There is no devil in hell, nor person that walks this planet that can destroy you. The only thing that can destroy you is your own doubt and your own fear. Don't let the voices destroy your journey with God because God is with you. God has great plans for you. I just feel like I need to pray for you right now. Is that okay? Hallelujah, hallelujah. I wonder if we could just raise our hands and pray in the Holy Ghost right now. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord. Lord, come on, let's let some faith activate right now. Lord, you've already won the battle. You've already won the battle.
if there is absolutely anything that we take away from any of this today, and I'm talking to me included, is we cannot let doubt and fear rule our lives. The enemy might seem weak, but our God, our God is bigger. It reminds me of a message that Pastor preached a few months ago, and it was he titled it "When Daddy Gets Home." See, the enemy can do whatever he wants. He can plunder and mess, and whatever God gives him permission to do, he can do to the full extent of that. But none of that's going to matter when Daddy gets home. None of that's going to matter when God steps on the scene. See, David, David's victory didn't stop in that valley with Goliath. Shortly later, David went on the run from the very person who crowned him a champion. From his best friend's daddy, if you will. And while David was on the run, he went through countless, countless battles running and hiding and moments he could have had victory over Saul but he decided not to put his hand on God's anointing but then there's one particular thing that David had to go through and that was at the place called Ziklag and see because of the victories that David had already won and that valley experience he had with the giant. He was prepared for Ziklag. It was a little tougher. See, Ziklag, whenever they were out at battle, they came in and took their wives, their children, their livestock, everything that they had. They emptied their camp and destroyed it. And David and his few renegade men were discouraged and said, God, you sent us here. What, what do you want us to do? But the first thing David did was not all, not just turn around and say, we got to go get that stuff back. First thing he did was fall to his knees. And he said, God, I know you have anointed me. I know that you have put me in this place for a reason. He said, and I know that you've sent these people here, and you haven't sent me here to die. He said, so now I know that there's victory, and I know we will recover everything that we got, but I need you to give me some strength to do this. And so after his little prayer meeting with God, David got up, and he gathered his men together. And by the way, his men were ready to kill him. Not only was his enemies wanting to kill him, but his men were wanting to kill him. He said, y'all hold off on that for a little bit. We're going to go and take these people, and we're going to destroy it. Not only are we going to destroy them, but we're going to take the stuff from them too. And so they chased him down. They destroyed him. They got everything back. And not that long after, David was anointed king of Israel. See, we don't know what the, what the journey is going to look like. I can't tell you that life is going to be fuzzy and perfect and it's candy canes, roses and powder puffs and rainbows that's not realistic and it's not sustainable if that's the way you think that living for God is because it's not the Bible tells us that it rains on the just and the unjust I can't tell you what your journey will be I can't tell you the things that we will go through, the things that we will face but I can tell you that, that there is a God that has already fought every battle. He has set the path for you, and He has not sent you here to die. He has not put you in this place, and nor will He ever put you in a place to leave you and let you die. So be encouraged today. We have a God that fights our battles. We have a God that is a victor over everything. Everything. In fact, the Bible says that 
All things were created by Him, and without Him was not anything made. So if He created it, He's got dominion over it. We've already won the battle. Be encouraged. Be encouraged today. God is on our side. It doesn't matter what the giants we face. God is on our side. There is victory in those low places. There is victory in the valley today. Hallelujah. Lord, bless y'all. I love y'all. Thank y'all for letting me minister to you for just a little bit. I appreciate y'all. God bless. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I think one of the greatest lessons that we can learn from this story today is that when you're feeling overwhelmed, there's a giant involved. When you're feeling overwhelmed, there's a giant involved. Or at least the voice of one who would call himself a giant. And when you're feeling that overwhelming voice and it intimidates you and it tries to push you into a little corner somewhere, that's when that spirit of David ought to rise up in you. When you, when you, when you feel overwhelmed and it's almost ridiculous to the oppression that you're feeling and the overwhelming that you're feeling. It's almost ridiculous. That's when you need to charge out of your corner. Yeah, you ever cornered a cat? <laughs> Anybody ever seen a cat cornered by a dog or another? Mm-hmm. And, he gets bought and that back raises up about like that. And the hair stand up and then he comes out with that claw and makes a mess out of that dog's face. That's what you need to be like in the Holy Ghost. When you feel overwhelmed and it's just barreling down on you, it's, it ends here, it's over, your life is over. This, this is not, you're not going to come through this. It's, I'm telling you, I feel this in the Holy Ghost. What you need to do is charge out of your corner, remind the enemy who your God is. I wouldn't even be hearing you if I wasn't a threat to you. You need to charge like David did onto the battlefield. You need not by my might, not by my strength, but by his spirit. By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I come against you. Come on. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come against you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. You unclean and foul spirit. The name of Jesus is against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. And you are defeated by our God and our King. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, let's worship our God in the presence of our enemy. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, King of glory. We worship you. You have all power. You have all authority. You are the victory. Hallelujah. The victory is in your name. The victory is in your power. The victory is in your spirit, oh God. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you.